Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome from wherever you may be uh, this morning. Today we start a brand new series on the minor prophets of the Old Testament, and I'm really excited about this. I am not a prophet nor the son of a prophet. In fact, I work for a nonprofit. <laughs> but my hope is over these next nine weeks together, we will come to see and understand the, uh, the importance of the minor prophets in biblical history and in our lives today. And we've, purchased, we've produced a nine-session study guide for groups and classes to use, and you can pick up a copy of that today if you haven't done so already. It corresponds perfectly with the Sunday morning sermon series. So on Sunday mornings, we're going to talk about one of the prophets here in uh, worship, and then during the week, small groups and classes will gather to talk about that same prophet in depth. And I think it's the ideal uh, learning format, kind of a lecture lab format uh, deal, especially if you have some weighty material. And Jenny Miller and Chris Walker did a superb job putting together the materials. Very easy to use, very helpful in understanding and applying the biblical writings of the prophets. You can purchase a study guide today for $5 at the kiosk around the corner, but here's a special tip. You can download a copy for free from our website. And if you missed the opportunity to sign up for a group, you can always join one of the Sunday morning groups. Sunday morning groups are always open every Sunday to guests and visitors. Or you can put together a group on your own. You just get the curriculum and pull some friends together and you can be off and running. And everything I've just told you about, you can find out about all of it at the kiosk this morning in person or go to ward.church slash newsfeed, ward.church slash newsfeed, all the information about this series. So, so let's begin. We're going to walk through some questions this morning, and the first question is this, what is a prophet? A prophet is somebody who speaks on behalf of God. Sometimes we hear that word prophet or prophecy, and we think it means future-telling, or foretelling, but that's not what prophecy means. The biblical prophets, uh, you know, God gave to them a message for them to give to their contemporaries. Now, sometimes the message God gave them to share was about the future, but more often than not, what God told the prophets to say had to do with the here and now. So when you think of, of prophets, think mouthpiece of God. God spoke through his prophets. There are many prophets, men and women, uh, recorded in the Bible. Not all of the prophets wrote books. Not all of the prophets have books of the Bible that bear their name. In terms of books of the Bible, there are 17 books considered prophetical writings, the writings of the prophets. And for the purpose of this series, we're talking just about the 12 prophets that are considered minor prophets. Biblical literature is divided into major prophets and minor prophets, and the words major and minor do not have to do with importance or significance, but the length of the writings. Minor prophets, their books are shorter than the major prophets. They are minor only in their brevity, not in their significance. In fact, I wanted to call this whole series, one of the ideas I threw out to our team, I wanted to call the series major league messages of the minor prophets and use a lot of baseball imagery. I thought it was a great idea, but the, the, the team rose up in prophetic judgment against that idea. The 12 minor prophets form the last 12 books of your Old Testament, and these are likely books of the Bible with which you are least familiar. Some of these books you have probably never read, and some of them you may have never heard of unless you were forced to in one of those read through the Bible in a year programs. Another idea I threw out to the team for the title of the series, I wanted to call the series Sticky Pages because this is the part of the Bible where your pages stick together because of infrequent use. Sticky Pages. I thought it was a creative idea, but the team looked blankly back at me much like you are doing uh, right now as if to say, woe to you, false shepherd of Israel. <laughs> but the fact remains, these books of the Bible are often avoided by people and by preachers. And I, I get it, I get it completely. Uh, you know, the prophets are hard to pronounce. 
You know, would you rather read Matthew or Habakkuk? You know, uh, the prophets include judgments upon obscure cities, strange imagery, uh, sometimes cryptic language, very avoidable indeed. But we avoid the prophets to our own detriment. And today I want to talk to you about why we need the voice of the prophets right now and why I think these next nine weeks are going to change us and change a little bit of the world. So again, the next question is, why should we read the prophets? Why should we read the prophets? And the first answer is because it's part of the Bible. I heard a preacher say, you would not want to be in heaven someday, and Obadiah walks up to you and says, so, how'd you like my book? And you've got to say, you know, honestly, I didn't read it. Uh, It was in a bad location, and I was worried it might be too weird. Right? Uh, The prophets are part of the Bible. They are part of the inspired, authoritative Word of God. In the Hebrew Scriptures, the 12 minor prophets came together as a unit. Uh, They were sometimes referred to as the Book of the Twelve, or sometimes just the Twelve, but they were regarded as Scripture. And in this series, we're going to cover just nine of the 12 minor prophets because of time limits. We'll cover nine of the 12, but you're going to get a very good idea of of, uh, a very good understanding of the prophets as a whole. Another reason we study the prophets is because they help us understand Jesus. In Luke's gospel, there's this story of the risen Jesus walking with two travelers on the road to Emmaus. A lot of you know this story. And the two travelers are kind of slow in recognizing that it's actually Jesus. And then Luke's gospel in that story has this line. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. In other words, all of the Bible, including the prophets, point to Jesus. If you want to know Jesus better, you will want to know the prophets better. It all points uh, to him. Now, I want to give you a word of warning or at least some explanation, uh, get some background about the prophets as to why the prophets are difficult to read sometimes. And what I'm about to say applies to both major and minor prophets, although, again, this series specifically deals with minor prophets. And I'll put it in the form of a question. Of of all the human emotions, sadness, happiness, anger, melancholy, of all the emotions, which emotion characterizes the prophets mostly? Silence, that's correct. Uh, No, no. Anger. Anger. Anger, and we talked about anger last week, and the prophets are among the angriest people you will ever encounter, and I'll give you some examples of this. The prophet Amos, we'll look at later in the series, uh, he says this, hear this word, you cows of Bashan on Mount Samaria, you women who oppress the poor and crush the needy. Now, you cows, this is not some ancient cultural compliment. Uh, This is a dig. This is exactly what it sounds like. This is name-calling, you cows. And name-calling is kind of what we resort to when we're feeling very angry. Look at the violent imagery of the prophet Micah, today's prophet. He says, listen, you leaders of Jacob, you rulers of the house of Israel, should you not know justice, you who hate good and love evil? He could have stopped right there. Sounds very prophet-like, we get the point. And the injustice in Micah was more economic, it it wasn't actually physical. So what he goes on to say is just metaphor, hyperbole, he could have stopped there, but he adds, who tear the skin from my people and the flesh from their bones. He could have stopped there, but he goes on, who eat my people's flesh, strip off their skin and break their bones in pieces, who chop them up like meat in the pan, like flesh for the pot. A little over the top, is it not? Did he really have to go there? Why are the prophets so cranky? What's the big deal? The prophets were given a gift from God. It was a burden, really. The prophets see and feel what God sees and feels and it nearly drove them crazy. They see God's beautiful intent for the world, and they see all the human sin and folly in the world, and the dissonance for them sounds like 
fingernails on a chalkboard. Now, I say fingernails on a chalkboard, and I realize not all of you know what that sounds like because we don't have blackboards anymore. So we have found a recording of fingernails scraping on a blackboard that we're going to play for you, but we're not going to do that. We're not going to do that. How many of you, though, just hearing it, just expecting it, we're starting to go, uh, right? Uh, imagine feeling that dissonance all the time. The prophets felt this dissonance in the heart of their being whenever there was injustice or sin. Now, we feel the heartache every now and again. I'm watching the news, and a story comes on that is so tragic, so heart-wrenching, so, so clearly an example of the way the world's not supposed to be that it produces tears. And uh, you, you felt this too. Maybe, it, maybe it's when a, there's a mass shooting Maybe you felt this a little bit when we watched Afghanistan being overrun. But the truth about me, and I'm guessing it's true for you too, is those news stories that bring me to tears are becoming increasingly rare because I've grown cold to the news. What I see in the news seems so commonplace. I've become accepting of it. There are dozens of stories on last night's news that should have bothered me that didn't. Now imagine that every story of sin and injustice bothers you to the core of your being because God has made you especially sensitive to this. Imagine you haven't grown numb to the condition of our world, but you're troubled by the dissonance of the world that God wills and the world that is, of the behavior that God expects of his people and the behavior of his people in reality. This was the gift and burden of the prophets no wonder they were so angry all the time. Old Testament expert Abraham Heschel says this, the prophet is a man who feels fiercely. God has thrust a burden upon his soul. He is bowed and stunned at man's fierce greed. Prophecy is the voice God has lent to the silent ag agony. God is raging in the prophet's words. So why do we need the prophets? We need the prophets to hear what we can't hear right now because we've grown deaf to injustice. We've grown numb to the condition of our world. And the prophets speak with such clarity and such conviction and often at such volume that they break through our numb hearts. The prophet Micah was writing about false prophets in his day, and he says this, if, if a liar and deceiver, these false prophets come and say, I will prophesy for you plenty of wine and beer, he would be just the prophet for his people. Prophet Micah has pointed out something here, uh, beer and wine, does that generally make someone more alert and sharp, or does beer and wine make someone more relaxed and comfortable? Don't pretend like you don't know. <laughs> the prophet's saying people would prefer to live in sort of a dull inebriation, right? That, that, that we prefer not to feel, not to notice, not to hear the pain of our world, and we need the prophets to shake us awake. Listen, prophets have never been popular uh, you know, they, they've always tried to get their voice through in a noisy world, and so angry words are one of the things they use to kind of break through the noise of the culture. But they also resort to shock tactics that we find quite bizarre. Hosea marries a prostitute to show how unfaithful Israel has become. The prophet Ezekiel cooks food over excrement to show how defiled God's people have become. Prophet Micah, the prophet of the day, walks around uh, wailing and weeping, barefoot and mostly naked as a symbol of the grief that he's feeling over what's going to happen to Israel. Listen, these guys did not get invited to a lot of parties. People avoided the prophets then and they avoid the prophets now, but we need them. 21st century American Christians may need the voice of the prophets more than Christians in any other time and place. Avoid the temptation to avoid them. 
Beware of the temptation to interpret the judgments as being only on other people, right? The prophets spoke to religious people. They spoke to God's people. They speak to us. Uh, We are so tempted to apply the Bible to people who aren't us, but the prophets are speaking to us. They challenge us to address our sins, not to harp on the sins of outsiders. So what do we do? What do we do with all this? Are we supposed to feel bad? Are we supposed to feel guilty? Are we supposed to be as depressed and angry as the prophets are depressed and angry? What good would that do? We'd all be medicated. And then here comes this line where the, that you heard read earlier where they're figuring out what does God really want? Do, do you want a burnt offering, God? And then it kind of escalates from there. You want a year old calf? You want a thousand rams, 10,000 rivers of oil, the firstborn? God, you want the firstborn of my body? And then comes this line that's become a beacon, not just to ancient Israel, but has become a gift to all of humanity, Micah 6, 8. God has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? That's what you want to know? What does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Three things. Act justly, love mercy, walk humbly with your God. I was thinking about this a lot because a lot of people feel like we don't know what to do. The world has changed so much. Things are moving so rapidly. Churches wonder, what what should we do? Christians wonder, what should we do? And Micah says, you know. You know what to do. You can pretend not to know. You can uh, pretend to be confused. You can say, I'm still praying about what God wants me to do, trying to discern God's will, but you already know what God requires. Act justly, love mercy, walk humbly with your God. And as we study the prophets together, our goal is not to become masters of knowledge, but to become people who are just and merciful and humble. That's where we're going. I want to talk about each one of those in turn uh, today. First of all, act justly. Justice is a really important word, and unfortunately, it is a word in our day that has been politicized and polarized to mean to support any kind of agenda someone wants to support with it. But I want to remind you today that justice is a Bible word, right? What we're talking about in this series is biblical justice. We're talking about the kind of justice that God requires of his people. And that's the word required. It doesn't say encouraged or recommended. God requires his people to do justice. And at some level, we all instinctively hate injustice. Think about a time when you have been treated unfairly. We could pass the microphone around this morning and hear everyone tell a story about a time you've been treated unfairly, and it would make our blood boil. I I told you uh, before that I've had some frustrating dealings with the probate court. My mom died a little more than a year ago, and I'm the executor of her will, and it should have been really simple uh, for her very small estate. But because of a few things we did wrong in the paperwork, it has become complicated and costly. And so I want to add my plug for this estate planning seminar coming up October 24th. Um, Really, I don't want my kids to go through what I'm going through right now. And the problems we're having would have been super simple to avoid. And uh, uh, really, if I had been to one of these seminars, I could have saved thousands of dollars of attorney fees and lots of headache and time, and uh, you may want to check that out. But back, back, to, back to my, my story. Uh, when when, when my, uh, my first appearance at probate court was back early pandemic when all court appearances were happening on Zoom. So I logged in and all my siblings logged in from our respective locations following the court instructions, and we got a little circle on our screen that said, waiting for host. And we waited for host for three hours. And I tried to call the court to see if something was wrong, and there was no answer at the courthouse. My sisters tried as well. One of my sisters got through and learned they were having technical difficulties at the court. We waited another two hours, and then we assumed we're just not going to get through. 
with the technical problems and we went our separate ways. And I was heading downtown. I was being interviewed by the local Christian radio station and uh, the court closes at five. At a quarter to five, as I'm pulling into the parking lot of the radio station, my phone rings and it's the court. And they say, we went to you on Zoom and you weren't there. And I said, I am so sorry. I can click on Zoom right now from my phone. They said, no, because you messed this up. Uh, we're going to do it on telephone. Can I text my siblings and have them log in? No, you can't. Court is in session. I was sworn in. And then the judge proceeded to berate me. Court times are not precise, and I had no business leaving Zoom. I apologized profusely, and I had sent in reams of paperwork, and it was all thrown out. Uh, yeah, she told me that I should have had an attorney with me, that I clearly had no idea what I was doing, and she intimated that I wasn't smart enough for the process and threw everything out. I tried to interject politely at points, but she wouldn't let me speak. Again, it should have been so simple. It was an uncontested will of a very small amount. She could have easily approved it, but she was angry. Now, I understand that she probably had a really hard day at court and had misdirected her anger toward me. We talked about that last week. I can reason what was going on, but I felt like I had been dealt with unjustly. And she was rude and belittling and condescending. And really, it, it, it rattled me to my core. I'm not used to be, being treated that way. I wanted to defend myself. Uh, listen, Your Honor, I am not stupid. I, I have a doctorate. I went to Princeton. I live in Northville. I'm a respected member of this community. Uh, and a lot of people find me very charming. You know, uh, I am not a criminal. She wouldn't have any of it. Now, I expect courts to be rough places. I know they see a lot of hard things, but I'm in probate court, and the only way you get in probate court is by having someone you love die. I don't know if I expected more sympathy, but it was awful. I, I, I wanted to write a letter of complaint, but to whom? She's the judge. She has all the power. As I lay in bed that night processing my day, I felt like God was telling me, I want you to reflect on this. I want you to think about this. This little taste of having someone speak down to you, which is so unusual and unsettling for you, is common for many people. Every day people get looked down on because of their address or education or gender or speech or color. Condescending treatment, I felt like God was saying to me, condescending treatment is new for you, but it is normal for a lot of people. Yale theologian Nicholas Walterstorff says that when it comes to humanity, justice means one should never treat persons or human beings as if they have less worth than they do. No one should treat human beings as if they have less worth than they do. No one should ever under-respect or demean them. He says that's biblical justice. We hate it when someone treats us unfairly. Right? We, we, we tell people about it. We, we write letters. We post it on Yelp. We put it in sermons. We, we, we think of you know, ways that we can get some taste of revenge. So God is telling us through Micah to get at least as energized when someone else is the victim of injustice as you get when it's you. Get at least as ramped up when someone else is the victim of injustice as when it's you yourself. In Micah's day, it was housing. The wealthy landowners were taking the homes and the land of the poor. The wealthy were using their power and influence to gain more for themselves. And Micah says it's not just robbing this generation, it's robbing future generations who would rely on that inheritance. And in Micah's day, in an agricultural society, when you take someone's land, you are also taking their livelihood. And the whole idea of the promised land in the Old Testament was that God owned the land and it was to be divided equally. So this is wrong on so many levels, but it may not have been illegal. 
I was trying to find this. It doesn't actually say in the text, and I was trying to research this to see if they were breaking laws, but it's very possible they were working within the laws of their day and working within the authority structure of their day to take this land. God calls his people to do not only what's legal, but to do what's right, to do what's just, and to use whatever influence or power you have to benefit other people, not just for your own advantage. And Micah tells them that God is not pleased by their greed and injustice and that judgment is coming their way. Do justly. I can't solve all the justice problems of the world, but I can do something. Everybody can do something. Maybe it's standing up to a bully at school. Maybe it's working for just laws. Maybe it's simply treating other people fairly. Ask God to help you notice injustice around you. Act justly. Love mercy was the second one. Love mercy. And the word Micah uses here for mercy is a very rich word. It's the Hebrew word hesed, often used for God's loving kindness, the kind of love that God has based on his covenant faithfulness. The psalmist says, for the Lord is good and his love, his hesed, endures forever. It's a love based on God's promises, not based on the deserving nature of the recipient. And it's a kind of love that's always expressed in action. It's not just a feeling. And Micah says, love mercy the way that God loves mercy. Extend mercy. Give a blanket. Pack a shoebox with toys. Tutor a child in the city. Give to an under-resourced neighborhood. Forgive a debt. Extend a second chance. Pay it forward. Be kind. Right? We, we, we make this so complicated, but it is not. There are hundreds of opportunities inside this church and thousands of opportunities that follow you every day of the week. Be kind and generous and compassionate. Act justly, love mercy, walk humbly with your God. It's hard to be a prophet and not get a little self-righteous. You think? We all struggle with this. We, we begin to act justly and love mercy, and then we become proud of how just and merciful we are. Self-righteousness just creeps into the human spirit so easily. Do you ever see this in a church? Do you ever see in a church somebody who loves to go around correcting everybody? Like they see themselves, I'm a prophet, and it's my job to point out the sin and error of other people. Uh, listen, there's an important theological distinction between a prophet and a jerk. Yeah. What burns most deeply in the heart of a prophet is not anger, it is love. Because the prophet's heart beats with the heart of God, and the heart of God is love, which is why I love the title that was chosen ultimately for this series. It's called Return, the call of the prophets for today. Return. It's really important that we get this, that underneath all the anger and judgment that we're going to see over the next nine weeks, underneath all the anger and judgment is this relentless, loving pursuit of a God calling his people to return. It's a cry of love, return. It's a cry given in humility because the prophets remember that they too are sinners saved by a loving, gracious God. Micah closes his book by reflecting on this good God. This is the closing of the book of Micah. Who is a God like you who pardons sin and forgives the transgression of the remnant of his inheritance? You do not stay angry forever, but delight to show mercy. You will again have compassion on us. You will tread our sins underfoot and hurl our iniquities into the depths of the sea. Who is a God like our God? There's no one like our God. And what does this good God require of us? You can pretend not to know. You can act confused if you want to. But God has made it clear. Act justly, love mercy, walk humbly with our God. 
Let's pray. Oh God, who is a God like you who pardons and forgives transgressions? You are the God of justice and power. You are the God of of grace and mercy. There is none like you, our God. Forgive our blindness to injustice. Forgive our dullness of heart and awaken us to life in your kingdom. And now, God, as we turn to share together the Lord's Supper, we confess our sins. They are many. We confess that we have not always acted justly. We've not felt the pain of others. We have withheld mercy. We have lived prideful. We have not walked with you. And so, God, forgive us, reclaim us, extend to us once more the call to return to you. And so we come to you depending upon your mercy and your grace and your power. Meet us now in the taking of the bread and cup. We pray this through Christ our Lord. Amen.